Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Dynasty Dugout Show. It is Tuesday. It's February the 20th, and we are going to talk minor league baseball. Today, we are covering the Washington Nationals prospects and farm system, looking at their top prospects. You can find the link in the description to the article that we will be covering today. Lots of fun names. There's some good video on some uh, Nationals prospects from camp that surfaced today. So that was a lot of fun. We saw Dylan Cruz uh, hitting a tank off of Cole Henry. LSU on LSU is a uh, batting huge, I think, in our Discord mention LSU fan. So that was a lot of fun to see. It's funny to see the demise of Dylan Cruz and how people have like just uh, kind of degraded him after Wyatt Langford had come up and just performed so well. And Cruz held his own, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but we'll be a good show. The national system is certainly better than it was in the last several years. So they've drafted a little better, I'd say. There's some fun arms in the system. So I am looking forward to breaking it down today. As always, if you are in the live room, if you could and you're visiting with us, make a free account. You can sub to the room. It'll You'll be notified whenever we go live here, which is every day. And that way you'll know and you can interact in the chat. And it also benefits me. So if you're hanging out with us and you're visiting, please do that. I would really appreciate it. Looking forward to the episode today. Let's, uh, let's dive in. Nationals top prospects. No surprise, we have Dylan Cruz coming in at number one. Dylan Cruz, like I said, he came into the draft as the top player. He was one of the best college players we have seen in some time. And now Wyatt Langford's college season was spectacular too. There's no kind of degrading Langford here when you look at the college seasons from last year. Both Cruz and Langford both had spectacular seasons and ultimately, we saw Langford take off in pro ball. And for Dylan Cruz, he performed well, but not as good as Langford. And that kind of saw him fall off a bit. People begin to say that he wasn't any good. I've seen takes saying he's not top 10 in this FYPD class. Like, there's just some wild things, like when we think about Dylan Cruz. But when you look at the profile, it's such a safe profile from a hit standpoint. His contact skills are incredible. The OBP skills are really good. I've seen people say, well, he's not going to steal. He didn't steal anyway. Like, he's never stolen bases, so that's not an issue with Dylan Cruz. But you know what you're getting. You're getting really good power. You're going to get really good, especially in an OBP league. You're going to get really good on base skills. And you're going to get good average in my opinion but the contact skills are super good i've been scooping up dylan cruz pretty much everywhere i can because i just really believe in this profile and if the cost is going to be diminished then well i'm absolutely going to buy in to what he's doing so cruz had some really big games i'll pull up some footage on him from this past year i saw him last year obviously at lsu got some decent footage but We've got some pro footage we will pop up in the stream to watch, and we'll break down the numbers on Cruz just to see a little bit more. Let's mute the video so that way you don't have to listen to that. So here's Dylan Cruz. I think he had a three-hit game here. There's a big tank. He is a little bit smaller, but he's built so well. He's listed at six foot two oh five. LSU career, 380, 498, 689, slash 58 home runs in 983 plate appearances. He struck out just 15% of the time while walking at a impressive 16% clip. So he walked more than he struck out in college. So those are impressive numbers in of himself, like just very, very good stuff from Dylan Cruz. You know the plate skills are good. He chased less than 15% of the time last year in college. His average exit velocity with metal was north of 95 miles an hour. He had an 85% zone contact rate and a near 110 90th percentile exit velocity. So even with those ticking down a bit with, with Wood in pro ball, 
you're still looking at plus power in the profile. Somebody that can hit you 25 home runs. And I think there's more juice in there than that. So 25 would be kind of an expectation when we look at Dylan Cruz and say, okay, like there is this potential for him to hit for more power than most people are giving him credit for. And you see it in the numbers. The raw data is there. <clears throat> there's always the talk like, will they push him quickly? I'm not sure because the fact is that the Nationals aren't going to be contending this year, and we know that. But he, in my opinion, is going to be ready pretty quickly. Maybe you look at the double A numbers and you're like, oh, they weren't great. But the ballpark that he played in in double A was one of the worst in the minor leagues. And it showed. He had very bad Babbitt luck. And ultimately, the numbers didn't look great, but who cares? Because still, the debut line in pro ball was 292, 377, 467. And to say that this player has fallen out of top 10s in FYPD is just is baffling, to say the least. I know most aren't there. I know that's a stretch, but that's been a take that's been out there. He was a good player that was passed by Langford. He has not taken a tumble. I think you're looking at a hitter that can hit 290, that can give you a 380-plus OBP, and give you 25 homers, and five stolen bases pretty regularly. So Dylan Cruz is someone that I am still very, very in on. You saw the video today of him hitting that monster home run. He is very, very good. And I'd be excited to have Dylan Cruz on a dynasty roster. G-Rex in the chat says, I took uh, Carter over Cruz recently in a dynasty startup. It's splitting hairs, I suppose, but hope it doesn't come back to bite me. No, I mean, Evan Carter, very high floor. Evan Carter is still one of the most impressive minor league players I have seen in person to date. And I've seen a lot of guys. Like, I've seen a ton of top 100 guys. And Carter just impressed me so much back in 2022. It was before he was even, like, becoming a thing. And it was just like, this guy did everything. He, gl like, glides like a deer in the outfield. He hit for power. He did so many things well. Where I, I love Carter. So I think, yeah, him and Cruz are close. But ultimately... Yeah, I'm not particularly worried about taking Cruz over or Carter over Cruz. You'll be fine there. Let's get to our next guy, James Wood. Wood is a very interesting prospect who he also hit a big home run today off of, uh, I don't forget who it was in camp, but it was a lefty, which was interesting. But James Wood, big six foot seven lefty. Of course, when you are that big, you get the Aaron Judge comp. It's it's kind of ridiculous, but everybody that's that big gets those kind of comps. And it's it's a little bit much. I mean, just being honest with you. Like, but James Wood is very athletic for his size. He's built 6'7, 240, but a really, really good athlete. He hits the ball incredibly hard. There's no denying the power here. I mean, it shows his ninth percentile exit velocity was 109 miles an hour with wood bats last year. So that already puts him in like the 70 grade power range. And he was 20 for the whole season. So like a 109 is like a 110 to 111 is like Aaron Judge, Ronald Acuna, John Carlos Stanton, that kind of power. So you know the power that you're getting with James Wood. It is it's massive, massive power. I'll pull up a video of him just to show you a little bit of the swing here with uh, James Wood. It is a, a big frame. Swing can get long at times, but still, like, very athletic. You see that one. I mean, he just goes the opposite way and just absolutely obliterates it for a big fly there. Wood, I think, does a lot well. He does have speed, too, which is pretty interesting when you look. He stole 18 bases last year, 26 home runs, and slash 262, 353, 520 between high A and double A. Here's the issue. 173 strikeouts last year, 31.5% K rate. So while it's fun to hit these big bombs and hit the ball extremely hard, you got to cut the strikeout rate. The contact rate, a little bit concerning at 68%. It does leave a lot to be desired, especially when you get those long levers like James Wood has. And again, you know that the power's there. You know he's got a good athleticism. He can steal bases. But here's the problem. Major, major struggles against breaking balls and off-speed pitches. The contact rates, very bad against breakers and off-speed. When you look at the numbers, that's my biggest concern because 
He swung at 50% of those pitches, breaking balls and change-ups, and he made contact at just a 51% rate against off-speed. That is not good. It's great he can get fastballs. He had a chase rate against sliders of 32%, which actually isn't bad, so he's got decent plate skills. That was his highest chase rate of any pitch type. So pretty appealing there that he doesn't chase. He's going to get on base, but the contact skills do concern me. I'd be lying if I sat here and told you that, oh, he's going to be fine. He's going to make enough contact to be good. I'm not sure that's the case, honestly. I think he's going to have to show major improvement next year, or this this year at least, against breaking balls and off-speed pitch types in order to excel. It's a fun profile. I dropped James Wood out of my top 10, but the upside still, you should bet on. I mean, he is really, really good. So it's fun, power, speed. But where does the contact lie? I think that's still to be determined. Brady House, number three in the system. This is a really fun system at the top, by the way. He's actually one of the first prep guys that actually went to like travel to actually see in person when I had started doing that back in the day. He was just really impressive, obviously, as a prep, like he was going to dominate the competition. Big six foot four, 215 pound frame. His name has been well known around baseball circles for quite some time. Very popular at a young age, like as a 14, 15 year old who just absolutely dominated on the showcase circuit. And he got a lot of buzz. But then it was like, well, ultimately, where, how much contact does he make and can he make? But he kind of proved that and pushed past that and showed that he was capable of making contact. The profile has been really interesting because he hasn't hit for the kind of power that you would hope so, but he surprisingly made decent contact skills. We'll pop up a video of him. You can see the swing. There's some interesting like opposite field power here. He's shown that even with Wood. I'm not sure on Brady House. Like, What does he project to be at this point? Beck shared this video, so here you go. You can see he, he looks a little smaller in 6'4", and the swing is shorter. But still, there's some some big pop to the opposite field there to go over that tall wall. Here's, here's what House does. He's a really good athlete, but he's been really limited by injuries. That's what I think, why the numbers haven't been as great as you think that they would be. 2023 was his healthiest season to date, and he played 88 games. He did post a pretty good slash, 312, 365, 497. 12 home runs, 9 stolen bases. The average was fueled largely by a very high BABIP, 388. He's not going to run a BABIP that high. And the contact rate around 70%, I think, does give a little bit of pause where it's like, okay, where does the average lie? And I don't think it's going to be as high as people think, but I do believe that House will be a 270-type hitter that hits for power. He is aggressive. He chased 35% of pitches out of the zone last year but it helps because he counteracts it with really good in-zone contact rates. The flat swing is a concern for some, too. You can kind of see it in the video. He hits a lot of balls on the ground. But ultimately, he hits the ball hard. He had a 107-mile-an-hour ninth percentile exit velocity. And while the home runs don't look as good, because he hits the ball on the ground, I do think that some of those can turn into more home runs over time. And I think we're going to see that. I think we're going to see House really develop power whether it's, whether it's this year or next, we shall see. But I still really believe in Brady House as a prospect. He's aggressive, but I think he can make it work. We'll see where the power lies. But I'm betting on a Brady House bounce back in 2024. And ultimately, I just think that he's a good prospect to invest in because the shine's kind of worn off a bit. And you can buy him at a reasonable cost. And so I would look to do that if you can. This next guy... He's one of my favorite buys in the system, and that's Kate Cavalli. I think he's an excellent buy in Dynasty Leagues. Cavalli looked like an ace last spring training, and I, I say that very lightly. He absolutely was electric in spring training before he went down with Tommy John. I've got a slow-mo video of his mechanics from this spring, so we'll pop those up. This is from uh, Mark Zuckerman, who is a beat writer 
for the Nationals. So here's this is this spring. You can see the mechanics slow mode here. I love Cavalli. And I think that he just fell off a of radar so much that it's made him an incredible buy. I mean, in 2021, he made the triple A, pitched 123 innings at a 3.36 ERA and 175 Ks. The numbers were still strong in 2022, but he did make his pro debut and it was a pretty rough one. But then spring training last year, we know he had the injury, went down, pushed his return towards June of this summer. But still, I really like Cade Cavalli a lot. He's built like a starter. He's got the frame that you want to dream on. He's got a big fastball. It's set near 96 when healthy, touched triple digits. The curveball was his most used secondary, sitting mid-80s, 50 inches of vertical drop, which is ridiculous. He plays the slider and changeup off of it well. They sit in that similar uh, velocity range in the upper 80s, but he has 25 inches of horizontal separation between the two pitches. I think Cade Cavalli could really take off as a starting pitcher. There are risk. There is a durability track record, like a lack of durability in the past. We'll see. I think he has to show that he can pitch for a full season healthy. But I will say that I do believe that Cade Cavalli could be somebody that really takes off. And I still think the hype has not caught up yet with him. He's a heavy investment for me in a dynasty league because I just really believe in the arm. And I will be buying everywhere that I can on Cade Cavalli. The fifth guy in the system is, is rather sad. It's Elijah Green. And even though I saw him live, I have no good footage of him because he struck out like every time that he came up to the plate when I saw him last year. I will say, he is built. That man is built like a NFL linebacker. Just a massive specimen, a massive human being. Elijah Green is a lot of fun as a athlete, but... The contact rates just really, really scare me. And it's hard to overcome. Somebody asked me the other day, like, what is the hardest uh, skill to develop? And for me, I believe that's contact. I think it's really hard to overcome the kind of contact rates that some of these players run, like especially when you're sub 60%, like Elijah Green is. Like I said, I have no good footage of him because he didn't do anything in either of the games I saw him last year. But here is a video of him just mashing a bomb, and you can see the the skills, at least, in the swing. He's insanely big. He's jacked, unloads with bat speed and power. There's never been any questioning those skills, in my opinion. He's always been somebody with, those, with the big power, but... He made contact at a 56% rate last year, 42% strikeout rate. That's just absurd. Like, below 70% is bad. Below 60% is very, very, very bad. He would have to make sizable jumps in contact rate to overcome and get into a respectable range. The good news is the ninth percentile EV was already 110 miles an hour. He maxed out at 118 last year that's pretty insane power when you think about it but he's got to make contact to get to it his speed was good the one time he put the bat on the paw i think when i saw him i clocked him at a 70 grade run times so massive power speed like you think about like a 30 30 type player but how much contact does he make i think this is one of the most volatile profiles in the minor leagues and he's very risky and it sucks because if you invested in him in FYPD last year, you're kind of stuck with him. You could try to sell him, but you're selling it like 10 cents on the dollar at this point. I think you'd be better off just holding and hoping that he makes a rebound and you can flip him for something. But if he figures out the contact skills, shoot, like this is going to be very, very enticing profile. And it could be one that you kind of regret not investing in. We'll see how it shakes out, but... He's just a very, very volatile player. Next guy is Yohandi Morales, who I like a lot, actually. I really, the more I dug in this profile, I'm like, hmm, this guy is rather interesting. The data from college to 
pro ball was interesting too, and I'll get to that in a second. But Morales is massive, six foot four. He's a big frame. He hits for power. This is from his college days at Miami, but he gets that bat around quick. Gets a lot of bat speed and just easy power there. This was in the regionals last year, right before being drafted. Here's the thing. He posted massive exit velocities in Miami, 94 mile an hour average exit velocity, 109 mile an hour ninth percentile EV. The swing is long. There was some concerns about the swing and miss issues against breaking balls. But then he steps into pro ball and kind of quieted those issues completely. It was a bizarre kind of turn of events. He moved from and played at four levels in a really short time, which was impressive. Between those four levels, he slashed 349, 423, 494. He had 16 doubles, four triples, no home runs, but the average EV with Wood was 91 miles an hour. The contact rate actually was good. It was better than minor league average at 75%. I thought that was a little surprising considering how aggressive he was. And he still walked at 10% of the time. I think that Yohandi Morales might jump into top 100 this year, and he just might overtake uh, Brady House as the best third baseman or corner infielder in this system. That's kind of a crazy take, but I really, really like this profile with Yohani Morales. So, you know, you obviously FYPD guy, if you did not invest in him, I still think you can trade for him because I think that there's some value here to be had. And I'm not sure the the hype has totally caught up with him. And so if you can trade for him, I would try to go and get him because I just really believe this profile could take off. Let's talk a little Dalen Lyle. He is little. He's smaller than you might think. But Dalen Lyle is a really interesting prospect who I came around liking a lot better after seeing him. This is against Ben Kaderna, and he just absolutely matched. This was the first at-bat of the game, actually. He exploded through this. Hit a massive home run to the pool side there. Dalen Lyle was smaller. He's 5'11", 195. But I thought he was the most impressive hitter on the Fredericksburg team when I saw them that had Elijah Green and several other hitters. Between two levels, he went from single A to high A, Wilmington. Wilmington, one of the worst hitter parks in the minors. The, the Nationals don't have good hitter parks, by the way, so take their stats with a grain of salt. But between both levels, Lyle hit 269, 355, 452. He had nine home runs. He had 46 extra base hits. So that was pretty impressive, I thought. And when you look at the profile, he's aggressive, but he makes really good contact. He had a 77% contact rate on the season, 80% while in single A. So I like Lyle. He's a little under the radar. He's like a deeper league guy because for fantasy, I don't think he's going to be like a super flashy type. He does have a good hit tool. He has good speed. So I think that at peak, he could get to like 15 home runs and he could steal 30 bases, but probably like a 10 home run, 25 stolen base guy might be a little more reasonable of a projection. So with Lyle, I'd say keep your, keep your, like, I guess, thoughts and projections in check with him. Even though he's fun, even though he makes contact, for fantasy, it's an interesting profile. Let's talk Robert Hassel. This has been a weird fall from grace for Robert Hassel, who I've seen several times at this point. He's been a twice-repeater of the AFL. It's twice. I guess he's been a single repeater, but he has been in the AFL twice now. And... It's weird. Like his body's changed in kind of weird ways. Like he's almost got smaller, not like obviously by height, but he's been a little bit, he's gotten a little bit skinnier. And the results really haven't come with Robert Hassel that you'd like to see. He was incredible in his first two seasons of pro ball. He slashed 303, 393, 470 with 11 home runs in 2021. And then in 2022, 273, 357, 407 with 11 home runs. And that was including a year where he was traded to Washington midseason. And the results after that went way downhill. I kind of chalked it up to saying, 
This guy was just traded for one of the best players in baseball in Juan Soto. So the pressure that he put on himself, of course, he's going to struggle. He moved across the country. But then things didn't get better in 2023. Spent time in AA, slash 221, 324, 321. A 645 OPS is not going to cut it. He had nine home runs. He had 27 extra base hits in four, or 545 plate appearances. Not good at all. The interesting thing is that the hit tool was the major carrying tool for Robert Hassel. That disappeared this year. He had a 72% contact rate, which is right at league average. It's not the plus or better hitter that we had known in the past. The noticeably skinnier part two kind of threw me off because I've seen him in three different years live, 2021, 2022, and 2023. And the body change is really weird. Also, the bizarre thing is, too, he hit the ball hard this year. He had a 90-mile-an-hour average exit velocity with Wood and ninth percentile of 102.2. Those aren't bad for somebody that doesn't put out much power. So with Robert Hassel, I look at the profile, and I'm like, who in the world is this guy going to be? I wish I had a good answer for that. I hope that if all clicks right, he can still be an everyday outfielder. The contact drop-off, the body changes, it's it's tough for me to project. I'm projecting him as like peak 15 home runs, peak like 20 stolen bases. But right now, I don't know, man. I think there's major questions about who Robert Hassel really is. So I hate to kind of go on a negative note there, but let's get to a positive note because Travis Sakura is awesome. Travis Sakura, a big righty that the Nationals drafted this year, who I am very, very excited about. He is a six foot six righty. The fastball gets up to 100 miles per hour. The slider is a plus offering. The question is how much will he develop that changeup? I think that's the major question and the major sticking point for him is can he develop that change up and be have serviceable three pitches? Because right now, I think the fastball slider are firmly plus, but we're going to need to see a little bit more for him to be able to have that stamp of saying, okay, this guy is a starter. I've got some video from Baseball America, Pete Flaherty, who does a great job. Covering the draft in college will pop up on the screen as you can see like how big this dude is and what he brings to the table. Let me share this with you. This is Pete's videos of Baseball America. See, big leg kick, big presence on the mound. Absolutely dominant with the fastball. He, it is size. Like he's going to have to throw the fastball down to make it work, which is interesting because at a higher release point, it's hard to get that high IVB fastball at the top of the zone. I do think that the changeup shows some flashes of being a really good pitch. If it improves the shape just a hair, then I'm like, okay, I'm way in here. So Sakura will be a fun one to watch. And from a pure stuff standpoint, future body projection, he looks like a starter. How many strikes can he throw? I think that's still to be determined, and we'll see this year. We'll see what he does in 2024 in a full season, and I think it's going to be really, really fun to watch Travis Sakura who I really love this pick and really love drafting him in a FYPD. This guy's kind of the opposite of Sakura, and it's DJ Hers, who, again, I've seen him several times over the years, and Hers was really, really good in the AFL. And we saw him in Fall Stars. I thought he looked rather impressive as well. And I'll pull up some of the video I had on him uh, from that outing. But DJ Hers, when you look at the profile, it's interesting because he is a lower 90s type guy. Fastball sits anywhere between 91 and 94. And he also has just major walk issues where he hasn't really figured this out yet. The strike throwing, all these things. It's like, okay, what is DJ Hers going to be? Like, is he going to be a reliever? And I'm not sure that question it's been satisfied yet. I do think that there's a chance that hers could still be a starter, but he's going to have to figure out the, the walk rate a little bit, the strike throwing. Here's some of the video I'll pop up, 
on the screen. This was our footage from the Fall Stars game this year. Let me mute and pull it up and play. So here's hers. Kind of see what you get. He's a lefty. He's a fun lefty at that. Kind of got a tough angle and arm slot. He hides the ball pretty well, in my opinion. You don't see it until last minute. So hard to pick up on what he's throwing. I do think he tries to overthrow at times, which does lead to the command issues. Change up, though, sits around 80. It's nice fading action. Throws it mostly to righties. Obviously, he's a lefty. The slider, it keeps hitters on their toes. Good sweeping action. He throws it to both lefties and righties. So get a little bit of that from both sides there. Fastball slider is going to both sides. There's a change up to a righty. So he's throwing the change up to pretty much just right-handed hitters. But hers, I think the biggest question he needs to satisfy is can he throw enough strikes to be a starter? He made gains when he moved from Chicago to Washington, so that was huge. But ultimately, who is DJ Hers? Is he a starter or a lever? I still say that's still up in the air, and we will see how this all clicks for him. Jackson Rutledge, big, six foot eight arm. He's a weird one because he was so dominant in his first pro season after being drafted. Missed the 2020 season with the pandemic. He came back and he really struggled with injuries, with arm, like just throwing strikes. 2023, threw 139 innings, which was huge, between AA and AAA, and he made four starts in Washington to end the year. Fastball routinely sits 95 to 96. It gets a lot of ride up in the zone. Big extension play. I think it plays up to like the upper 90s just because of how big he is and how much extension that he gets. Changeup averaged 89 miles an hour last year. Again, the ability, strike throwing. How much strike throwing ability does he have? 56% strikes last year is not great at all. And that's going to have to majorly improve in order for him to be able to stick as a starter. I think he's going to get run as a starter, but I think he's probably in the bullpen long term. So this will be an interesting player to follow. Jackson Rutledge, just a big dude with a big fastball with not so great command. This next guy is pretty interesting. He's one that maybe I'm a little low on. That's Andrew Pinckney. He's a drafty out of Alabama who we saw for the first time this year in pro ball. And I thought Pinckney looked really good. And I'll mention a couple of things about him. There were some weird things with his data that kind of changed from college to pro ball. You see the swing. He just obliterates that ball. But Pinckney, you look at the college profile. In college, 107 mile an hour ninth percentile EV. That's really big power. But just a 69% contact rate. It's like, okay, how much contact can he make in pro ball if he's making sub-70% contact against college guys? Just concerning. But he stepped into pro ball he made contact on pitches in the zone at an 83% clip. He chased just 24% of pitches out of the zone, which was huge. And he still had some power. He hit 320, 321, 415, 457 last year between four levels. They aggressively pushed him to double A. He hit four home runs. He stole 11 bases in 41 minor league games. Like, okay. I think there's some interesting things here to like when we're looking at this profile with Andrew Pinckney. So, I'm watching this one closely. I think he could really move up boards. He's one to like. I think mean, he's got power. He's got speed. He's got a projectable frame. It's just the contact skills. How much contact does he make? And I say, still to be determined on that. Jarlin Susana. He's one that I did get to see live this year. Pull up some footage of him. We saw him. It was an interesting game. It was a... Rain delayed start, so his start when it was a little later, so he was pushed back a bit. I think he still pitched five innings in that start. Four and two-thirds, excuse me. Uh, but he did strike out 17 whiffs in that outing. Let me pull up the video for you here so you can see. Susana was a fun one. Scouts I talked to do believe that he can be a starter long-term, which would be huge for him. He's a big guy. He stands at six foot six, 240. He was part of the Juan Soto deal as well. Fastball, 99. Tops at 103, which is just kind of absurd to think about. 
few starters have that velocity. Honestly, few starters have this frame that he has either. And so it kind of leaves questions with like, okay, will he be a starter? There's effortless velocity in this frame. So I don't think he's really putting too much into it where it's like, I think he can stick as a starter. And most scouts that I talk to believe the same. I still think there is reliever risk here. Just how many strikes does he throw? Slider sits up or 80s, it touched 90, got whiffs. He throws a changeup in that similar velo band, but the changeup actually got into like the 92 range on some occasions, which is interesting. Curveball is a decent fourth pitch at the time. I think that reliever may be a more likely outcome until we see him at higher levels throwing as a starter, but we shall see. We will see what Yarlin Susana becomes, but I do like the profile. I like the ability to get outs, to miss bats. I'm pretty intrigued by Yarlin Susana's profile. He's one I think that could move back up my rankings, but he still needs to show a little bit more that he can just still throw strikes, limit walks, and get outs. So Yarlin Susana's fun to dream on. There's upside. I think he's still a potentially good investment, but I'd keep a close eye on Yarlin Susana as a pitcher, especially as he moves up levels. And I think it'll be pretty telling in 2024 who he is. Now, this next guy, one of my favorites in the system, he made a major leap forward. Unfortunately, he is going to miss the entire 2024 season. He needs Tommy John, which absolutely sucks. That came out in November. He was going to miss the year. He had a really strong season this past year. He actually had Tommy John in September. He'll be out until 2025. But the steps that he took as a starter this year were huge. You look at Jake Bennett as a pitcher, and I really like what I saw. He's a low 90s guy, which... I never love, but 92 to 93 range. So it's not like the velo's that bad. It's fine. He's a big lefty, actually, a low effort six foot six frame. He repeats the delivery well. He had posted a 3 1 4 ERA with 73 strikeouts and 16 walks and 63 innings. The fastball velo did average just around 90, which is a concern. He did some starts sitting 92 which is better. The command is excellent here. He threw strikes at a 67% clip, which is one of the higher rates among all minor leaguers, which I think is substantial. And that's very, very important for his ability to be a starting pitcher. The TJ sets him back a ton. You hope that he is going to come back. You hope that he is going to have some velo. I think that'll be a big thing. The changeup was incredible this year. Low 80s, a lot of fade. 47% chase rate, 42% whiff rate on that pitch was incredible. The slider also did a lot of damage. The slider generated a 41% whiff rate. That was huge. So Jake Bennett is a fun arm, but unfortunately, he's going to be out of sight, out of mind, and we won't see him until 2025 again. So I think it's one of those cases where maybe you just let Jake Bennett kind of simmer, and then later in the year, you go and get him a throw-in and a deal. And I think that would be kind of a good move to make. Just like when you look at the profile, I still think there's a lot to like with Jake Bennett. So you don't need to go out and get him right now. It's not going to cost you as much. So uh, Jake Bennett is a good investment later in the season, later in 2024. Because right now, if you can get him as a throw in a deal, then sure, you should do that. The next guy is still such a major wild card, and that's Christian Vaccaro. He's been weird. He was one of the top signees in 2022. So he's still young. Excuse me, he was in the 2021 class. He got near $5 million. He was an advanced bat at the time, really projectable six foot three frame. He's still quite lanky. He hasn't filled out well, which is interesting. I still wonder if there's potential for him to fill out but the swing's kind of funky he hasn't done a ton in my opinion but there has been some goods so there's been some positives in the profile from the left side especially on the inner half he can turn on pitches 
and really get to some power. We haven't seen him fully unlock it yet, but I do think there's some potential here. We'll show you the swing so you can kind of see that. I hope that Vaquero works out because I really like the bat. I really like the potential. And you see that inner half, turn on it, no problem. He did have a solid season, which he put together a 410 OBP at the complex with 12 extra base hits. But in single A, Fredericksburg slash 197, 321, 288. The contact skills were okay. And the plate discipline was good. The 70 grade run times are really good. I kind of just want to bet on this power developing. You look, and man, that was some serious bat speed. He turns on that pitch, gets to it with ease, and hits that homer. So with Vaquero, I think you're just betting on the upside and potential here. I still think there's that ability. I think there's the potential, but we'll see how it all pans out for Christian Vaquero. Interesting player. Hard to project at this point, but the upside is there. Next guy is a lefty. It's Mitchell Parker. Parker was drafted three times before signing in 2020, which is pretty interesting. Fifth round selection. Rough debut in 2021, but he's flown under the radar. And I thought he did some really good things this year that didn't really get noticed. I know Nate Handy likes Mitchell Parker a lot, too. He's talked a lot about him in his B-Sides pod. But he's a lefty. He can get strike. He throws a lot of strikes, actually. And I'll pull up some footage here of Mitchell Parker so you can see that. I like the profile. I like the ability to throw strikes here. And I think the question marks are still, well, what is the arsenal like? And how does it play out? Because there was some volatility. But between May 21st and September 7th, that was 16 starts, 86 innings. Parker posted a 3-1-2 ERA. Had 101 strikeouts, just 31 walks. Fastball, he throws it quite often. Seeing 92 to 95. Decent life up in the zone. The slider, low 80s, change up mid 80s. I do think there is some bullpen risk if the command doesn't improve. Like sometimes he leaves the pitches over the heart of the zone, which is different than control and strike throwing. But when Parker is on, I really, really like Mitchell Parker's ability. So he's interesting. He's not a huge investment. He's a deeper league target for me. But one that I look at Mitchell Parker and say, okay, maybe... There's something here. Maybe he is a major league pitcher. I say still to be determined on that, but interesting prospect to look at and bet on. Cole Henry, who gave up that big bomb to Dylan Cruz today. When Cole Henry is on, the stuff is really good. When he is healthy, the stuff's really good. But unfortunately, he had thoracic outlet syndrome surgery, which is kind of a career derailer for the most part. He threw just 33 innings last season. Several arm issues. Thoracic outlet certainly affects everything. But when he's on, there's a mid-90s fastball with a lot of ride at the top of the zone. Secondaries are strong. Throws a change up in the mid-80s with good fade. Pairs it with a slider. It's a ton of horizontal separation between the two pitches. I think Cole Henry is likely more of a bullpen arm, though, just because he can't stay healthy. I hope the best for Cole Henry and that he can ultimately see if he can just throw innings. Health is huge. So I am interested in Cole Henry in a deeper league, but it's still a major, major question mark. TJ White's a fun one. He was a prep outfielder, 6'2", 210. He missed a lot of 2023 due to injuries. The results when he did play, I think the injuries lingered all year. He did make the move uh, to first base, which would be is interesting. So outfield first base type, fifth rounder in 2021. He had a big 2021 season. He seemed prime for a breakout, um, but the injuries derailed him a bit. White has some power. He's got some kind of interesting speed, too, for his size. He moves pretty well. So uh, TJ White's one to watch in the system. And I'd say probably the other guy to watch is Alain Soto, who's Juan Soto's brother. So he's got the pedigree. He's got the hype. He tits strike out. At a 38% clip in the DSL, which is not, not good at all. When you strike out that clip in the DSL, there are issues. But there was a lot of hype on him before. I just keep an eye on Alliance Soto and see 
what he could be. That's it. The system's kind of top heavy. There's not a lot of depth to it. The Washington National System does have some talent, though. There are some guys on the way. Do they push Dylan Cruz this year? That's the question. We'd all love to know that. They push James Wood? Probably not. When Cade Cavalli comes back, is he going to be a good starter? I certainly hope so. But a lot of talent, that kind of runs down them all. Thank you for hanging out with us today live. You can catch it on YouTube and in podcast form very soon. And thank you for joining. Hope you have a good rest of your Tuesday. Have a good one. We'll see you tomorrow.